All right, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Jetpacks to the Bank. I'm Andrew. I'm here with my co-host, uh, Joe. I mean, I don't know, same story over and over again, but the Phillies dropped this series two games and three to the Mets as they won the first one, could have won the second one, but ultimately lose. And once again, they could have won the night, but instead they decided to lose as well. First off, Joe, what are you feeling today? Uh, Not too great. I mean, I did put in a... a uh bet for the Bengals too and they ended up coming up a little bit short so you know nothing worked out other than the fact that Baker threw an interception and I did put in a bet for (laughs) Baker or Burrow to throw an interception assuming that would be Baker and even though he had a pretty good game overall he still got that pick for me so thank thank, thanks Bake Show at least you got at least you won one yeah but uh first real quick all right talking about football before we get into the Phillies I didn't watch much. Of, I didn't watch any of the game. I was watching baseball. But Joe Burrow, sixty-one passes as a rookie, second career start in the NFL, and they have him throw sixty-one times. I mean, they, they got to fix that up. But uh, I don't want to get too much into them. Yeah, they also but, probably would have won if their line was not worse than the Eagles. Like man, they honestly looked worse than our offensive line. <laughs> that's pretty hard to do. So shout out to Cincinnati for finding a way to be worse. But anyway, we're here to recap this Philly series. Let's get into it. First off, why don't we start tonight? We had a nice uh, uh, tonight. Yeah, we start with uh, I mean, before we get into the actual games. Shout out to former first round, first overall pick, twenty sixteen, and uh, Mickey Moniak finally got the call up yesterday. I uh, did not receive any playing time yesterday, rightfully so, against a, arguably the best pitcher in the game, Jacob Degrom. Not the guy you want to make your debut against. So they decided to give him today. It goes 0 for 4 with a walk. I mean, before we get into the series overall, what were your impressions, or not impressions, but what were your, was your overall intake of uh, Mickey Moniak there in left field to start his uh, MLB career? Um, I think he showed a pretty solid sight line at the plate. Uh, I mean, he looked at pitches he shouldn't, he shouldn't have swung at for the most part, and then he flew out on a hard ball to right on his first at-bat. He obviously drew a key walk. Uh, late in the game off of a guy that this year actually is pitching pretty solid again, unlike last season. So uh, that that was a big thing for him to just – he he was – I mean, Lugo, yeah, he did struggle, but, I mean, he's not an easy pitcher to hit either. Uh, he's having a very good year. This was really his first completely off game. So I like how he looked and was able to control the strike zone because with being able to control the strike zone normally – comes hits as a you you get more comfortable at the plate as a whole so I do like how he seems like he's already which we kind of knew uh coming up the realm that he's already a smart hitter but that's going to translate over time and what they were saying on the telecast that he starts once he starts hitting doubles when he starts putting more muscle on I mean he's going to obviously be able to turn some of those doubles into probably line drive home runs and stuff like that no, I agree. Uh, I thought overall something to, to keep an eye on. Uh, definitely a reason to tune into these games. And I thought the ninth inning, I mean, I know we didn't get a hit or anything. Well, but to to be how much up, he plays him. Well, yeah, yeah. But to be <laughs> up in, that ninth, in the ninth inning, they're in a big spot. He wasn't over-anxious. He drew a good at-bat and ultimately got a kind of walk. I know it's not the ideal hit, but he drew a walk in, in an important at-bat, obviously, there. Uh, so I thought that was a good sign there, not to see a young guy over anxious like that. So I think that was a good takeaway there. Um, but hey, again, before we jump into the actual details of the game, another thing, story to take or headline to come out of this one was the injury bug continues to hit you. Obviously, you, you saw Hoskins and Real Muto miss some of the Marlins games, and you knew they weren't going to play this series. Uh, and ultimately, they're going to be out over the weekend too. But you come out of this series with, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but. Two, two more injuries here. I can't remember if there was any more serious injuries. But Jake Arrieta is going to be out for the regular season now with a hamstring injury after pitching pitching Monday. And then today, Gene Segura gets beamed with, I think it was a 98. I say beamed. That's kind of wrong. Got hit by a pitch, uh, 98 mile per hour, uh, right to the elbow. And he's already, he's already basically already said after today's game, he's going to be out for at least the next two, if not more, games. Um, so, I mean, what, what's your initial takeaway from those? I mean, who, who do you have replaced every at this point? And, and obviously, you know, I'll put Kingery in there at second for, for Segura. But ultimately, 
The Phillies are going to start running thin here in the near future. Well, that's the issue. I mean, Segura was playing more third recently, so how are you fixing that conundrum? Because, yeah, you can put Kingery in at second, but because of Boone playing first for Hoskins, you would have to kind of move the whole infield. Now, when JT comes back, I don't think he's going to be catching because he has a hip flexor. So that might fix your problem as is. You'll probably throw him at first, put Boone back at third, and then put um, not Segura, Kingery at second for Segura. So, I mean, normally I'm somebody that is to the max horse on Gene Segura. <laughs> so, uh, in the recent weeks, I'll give credit where credit is due. He finally went back to being an average hitter and not swinging like Aaron Judge. Uh, so, I give him a lot of credit for doing that. So, he got injured at the worst time. Uh, he was starting to pick up, like I said in my preview video on the channel before today's game, the slack for other people these last two weeks. So he went down at the time when he was the most confident. Hopefully, though, since King Gerson's coming back, has looked more poised in his at-bats, is able to continue to do that, and then he can pick up some of the slack uh, for Segura now being out for hopefully only two to three games. But, you know, when you injure your elbow, that's something that can be quick or something that can nag you for almost, unfortunately, the rest of the season. So, Yeah, I think, uh, well, well, first, Segura, like you said, wrong time for Segura. He had a walk tonight, but besides that, six for six in his last six plate appearances after four for four uh, Wednesday night and then two for two uh, this evening. Um, but honestly, correct me if I'm wrong, but I... I I think you're right out tonight's lineup and just sub Kingery for Segura. I mean, until JT comes back, um, I mean, you're going to probably put Gosselin at first. I mean, I don't know. Because if you if, say you move Bone the first, who you gonna, I guess you could put Gosselin at third. But, I mean, at this point, you're scratching thin. I mean, you already cut Neil Walker. You, I think they DFA'd uh, Glaber Torres. Or not Glaber Torres. Uh, Ronald Torres. Yeah, Ron, Ronald Torres the other day. So you're, you're already scraping thin bottom. Which I mean, made no sense because they keep putting, they DFA Neil Walker, then they caught up a guy Girardi likes, and they got rid of him right away. And I'm like, exactly. why? Well, what is the point with getting rid of Neil Walker? Then? Um, I did read, apparently, I think Jay Bruce could come back tomorrow. So you, you could put Bruce at first and Bowman at third. By the way, Bowman, That's the only confident position I would even put Bruce at. Otherwise, I think he's basically just glass, unfortunately. Which like, is a shame, too, because yeah. with Hoskins out, I thought Bohm looked a lot better at first and third. So now you're kind of hurting your defense, in my opinion, at that spot. So it's going to be interesting what they do. Um, but, yeah, no, it, we're, we're scraping now. And you got two games tomorrow. It'll be interesting to see what they do with the rotation tomorrow. Uh, you do have Listy, if I'm not mistaken, on your now. I don't think he's fully ready for the majors. Don't get me wrong. But if I'm not mistaken, I think Listy was on the taxi squad. He is, and they could call him up. First baseman, yeah. I, I don't know if they'd call him up over Bruce. I mean, he won't play over Bruce, right? Well, no, 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 no. I'm saying if you wanted to call up an actual first baseman and a uh, guy that doesn't get injured every tenth of a second, uh, unfortunately. I mean, he yeah. still hits well when he's healthy, but he literally doesn't stay healthy. He's basically our version of a bunch of people on the Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, just the way it is with him, unfortunately. Nah, I completely agree with you. Um, but all right, moving on, let's move on to this series. But we'll, we'll uh, I mean, I know I said maybe go away from the, the let's just do a quick run through. Uh, yeah, thir- Tuesday night, yeah, Jake Gary had to go five innings. You, you win the game 4 1. Bullpen actually probably looked the best they have all year. Um, but they get the job done. You, you go in, you go in. Uh, into Wednesday night thinking the same thing, like what's going to happen here. And ultimately, you had a guy who did, who had to miss his last start with that fingernail issue, and this guy went out and gave it his all, and that's Zach Wheeler. I mean, he, he just went out there, pitched like he was perfectly fine, gets the job done, and then the bullpen does their thing, gives up two runs, blows the game, and you lose 5-4. And the same thing tonight. You, Part Arnold, of that game I will put on the manager. Uh, tonight or last night? Last night. Uh, well, before we get into that, let me just tell it tonight real quick. And the same story tonight. You had Aaron Nola, who, yes, he didn't have his best stuff, but he left there. He, I mean, he had a bad first inning, settled down after that. He left the game with a 6-4 lead, I believe, and it all went downhill from there. Um, the, you, you give up six runs in the next three innings, and you lose 10-6. to six. Um, Also, I can question the manager tonight as well. So, 
let's start with the manager because it seems like you got something on the manager. So, well, what what was your issue with the manager? And I mean, what, well, what do you just think of him overall this year so far? I kind of texted you, obviously, as a joke. I'm not going to ask somebody as a manager if they have 120 pitches. Hey, can you still go out there because our bullpen is abysmal? Uh, but. With 95, I think it was, if I'm yes. not mistaken. Yes. Uh, he could have still pitched the rest of that inning. And yes, he has a messed up finger. But as Wheeler even said in the post game, it didn't bother him that much. So if it wasn't bothering him that much, plus it clearly showed it wasn't bothering him that much, other than on one pitch that he gave up a home run. And I mean, it that that just happens in general. So in, in most games, sometimes you throw one or two pitches that you leave over. And the guy took advantage of it there. But, I mean, I think he, with the way he was cruising and going, you should have let him go a little bit. He probably would have finished at like 105 if he had a pretty good inning, uh, clean inning there, and let him finish the eighth inning because then you would have had uh, Hector to just go for the ninth and try to figure it out, hopefully up by two rather than uh, up by one, if I'm not mistaken. I think we were at the point of when uh, Hector came in. So that would have helped us out a lot more rather than and we'll be tied when Hector came. I think we were tied yeah, when Hector. I think Hector Morgan, came, Morgan I think, came in up one. Yeah, Morgan tied it. Morgan given up a hit, tied it up. I forgot about that. So well then no wonder Hector sucked. He can't pitch when we're tied. But I'm gonna call the, <laughs> I'm gonna call the defense here too. Ricky Bo said it as well. I don't know if you know you watch a lot of the post games too. I don't know if you watched yesterday's. But one, I mean oh, that's I get it. I disagree with you. You're already taking him out, too. But you go to the ninth inning. Are you kidding me, Hector Neres? You're going to drop the ball like that? <laughs> like, that that's just, that's unacceptable. Like, get set, deliver the ball, and that turns into a balk. And then you get forced to walk a guy you were going to pitch to. And then ultimately, I forget the next guy, but he, he comes up, and he knocks in the, the game winning run there, which yeah. ultimately should have been caught as well. I, I agree with Ricky Patalco. True. Hey, Hazley misjudged that ball. And if he wouldn't have misjudged uh, it, he doesn't have to sit there and jump. Uh, instead, he's getting underneath yeah, he that ball, and, back his, and he so. catches it at the fence. Um, so another misplayed ball by the Phillies defense. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and call I think it. it's he's, also – I'm just going to sit yeah. out and call, call it the entire Phillies defense because outside of Hazley, too, I can't remember who had the error last night, but we had another error as the defense is, uh, on the defensive side. So it's more than just that. And, I mean, it, it's these little things. It's what separates you from being a good team yeah. and a bad team. You have to make that play. But the other thing is when you're throwing guys in an outfield that are used to playing center field, like, for example, Moniak in left has played a lot of center field in the minors. I wouldn't be surprised if you see him misjudge a ball because there's way different slants and angles of the ball coming at you from the corner outfield. And like I said in the previous video, that's not Major League Baseball. That's just baseball in general. Go play in high school. There's different, plenty different angles hit at you from right field to left field than there is at center. So I also think that's bad managing because Quinn has played in the corner a lot more than Hazley recently, and he's done fine wherever you put him. If you wanted to move somebody, it should have been Quinn, not Hazley. But it, it, but it, he's still on him for not making the play. But I also think you have to put guys in their most comfortable position. And guys that you think are actually starters, where lately Quinn has been shown to be a platoon player. So. No, I don't disagree with that. I just I don't know those guys well enough that, that maybe he does prefer that. And we don't know. Uh, maybe he does talk to him. I mean, he's done it all year with those two. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But it's... Moving on to tonight's game, I, I don't know what was more frustrating, last night or tonight. I, I really don't. Uh, both terrible losses. But I said uh, going into today, I said yesterday was the worst loss of the season. And then today might have been worse, honestly. Um, but again, Aaron Noel struggles. You, you, you pick him up, and he leaves the game at 6-4. And the same thing happened. And, and I don't know about you, but this is where my issue came in, is – with a bunch of lefties coming up in that ninth inning, instead of going with JoJo Romero or Adam Morgan, um, instead you go with Workman, who's been absolutely terrible. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. He's been absolutely terrible. Uh, he, his curveball sits there for anybody in the world to hit. Uh, I mean, it really just hangs there. It, it might be the easiest curveball in the league. Um, but but he comes in, gives up another three runs, add that to his resume with the Phillies, um, before Clevenger comes in and gives up the last one. Yeah, because uh, Romero didn't pitch yesterday. Only Morgan did. And also, if you can't pitch back-to-back games when you pitch 
two thirds of an inning, then you have an issue there. So, yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I think they should have went Romero. He's been the best reliever on the team outside of him and Parker. Uh, yeah, I think those two have probably been the most consistent, at least on the team so yeah, far this year. Putting Garrett Clevenger after Brandon Workman didn't do very well, who's a rookie against Cano, who's having one of his best seasons since about four years ago uh, this season. And I don't know what made you think that was a brilliant idea because, I mean, yeah, the dude has looked like he can be something eventually from when you watch him in the minors. Now, probably not because he doesn't have the best control and you kind of saw that leaving one up and in to Cano, which, yeah, usually lefties like it down and in, but if you've seen Robbie Cano before, when you leave it in that spot, just like Harper killed his home run, normally if he picks up on that, he's going to smoke that thing just like he did. So... That was bad pitch sequence to begin with, if that, unless if he missed his spot. Uh, but other than that, that wasn't the best pitch sequence either. But two, he shouldn't have been in the game. Yeah, no, no, I completely agree with you. Um, unfortunately, it's the way it is. I, I, I don't know what's going to change. I, I mean, at this point, I don't think anything. And I think, I think it was you used the word in our chat, or maybe you directed the message to me. But at this point, this team's just a disgrace. I think it was you that used that, right? Yeah, yeah, I put uh, that in both things, I think. <laughs> No, but you're absolutely right. I mean, at this point, it's it's the same thing every night. And here, we're not gonna let's not let the offense get away with anything either, because they they do know they're allowed to score after the fourth or fifth inning, right? Like they <laughs> do know the game's not over, right? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, the guy that's been setting our trends uh, lately, McCutcheon, who's been doing good at the top of the lineup, really struggled tonight and went over five. He had two strikeouts, left three on base, and then after Moniac drew his walk, of course, got out with the bases loaded. And then big time, his first game struggling of the season, which, I mean, he is a backup, so I don't know how much I can truly get on him. But Knapp played a very big game and left seven people on base. Granted, he's getting overplayed right now, just like Phil Gosselin is because of injuries. Uh, th- that shows usually just naturally, eventually, when you're but, overplaying. But here's my thing. That's fine. Uh, you, everyone will have a bad game. But I'm not going to give the rest of the offense a break. Even with those guys, even with McCutcheon going over five, even with Knapp going over four tonight, two guys that have been on, but they struggled tonight. You still scored six runs in the first two innings without them doing anything. So what about the rest of the guys? Like what happened to the rest of the team? Did they just took the night off? Like I don't, I, I don't know what the, what the story is here. It, it obviously needs to be fixed. Yeah, the only people that did good tonight were three through five until Gene got injured and then Kingery got out and his one at bat because uh, Harper was two for three uh, because he also had two walks and then Boom was two for four who had a walk and uh, Gregorius was two for four um, and then Segura was two for two before he came out yeah. and also and then- had a walk obviously because he got hit so. And then Hazel had an RBI as well. Yeah. Um, but no, it, it's honestly tiring. It, it's really the same thing every night. And I don't know I don't know what's going to change. Because at this point, I think th- th- this is who the team is. I, I really like, and you're scratching for dear life right now. And who knows whether you're going to be able to uh, survive. No, I mean, at this point. Ahead of us right now. What is that? I said, I think we know whose team's ahead of us right uh, now. I'm going to get there. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but no, at this point, you only sit in a half game above um, the St. Louis Cardinals to the final final playoff spot. You're, you're, you're really scrapping here. Um, Marlins lost tonight. You had a chance to gain ground on them, and you blew it. You, and as simple as that. You could have been a half back at second place. Instead, you're sitting here, I believe, a game and a half back still. And you brought it up, so let's get to it. Because now you're a game behind one and only Gabe Kapler and his San Francisco Giants. I mean, you can make fun of him all you want last year and call him a bad manager, but he is a very uh, bad roster playing good baseball right now, above 500. With they're at 49 games, so they got 11 games left in the season, just like us, and they're sitting here above this team. And I know things can change. We can go on a five-game winning streak while they can lose five straight, and it'll be all fine and dandy then. But let's tell it the way it is right now. And the manager everyone hated is. Having his team play better ball than the Phillies right now. Also seven and three in his last ten, which uh, would all be in September, obviously, because it's what the sixteenth now or seventeenth, eighteenth uh, now. Um, but 
that was our Achilles heel, obviously, here, which it still is, uh, is playing in September. Well, that hasn't carried over for him to San Francisco, so that shows that that's a Phillies issue, not a Gabe issue. No, you're absolutely correct. Um, and I'm going to sit here and I'm going to answer this question before I ask you it. I'm going to say yes. But right now, do the Phillies hold on for the eighth and final spot or better? So basically, will the Phillies hold on for a playoff spot, no matter what seed it is? What's your answer? The only reason they might is because they got lucky. The Cardinals are three and seven in their last ten. They're really starting to struggle at the worst time to struggle, and they're on a two-game losing streak. If the Cardinals actually were playing like they were about a week ago, uh, no pun intended to the song, uh, but <laughs> uh, the Phillies probably would be looking at blowing their playoff chances. But since the Cardinals are falling back down to earth that might help them out uh, also because the another team that if they went on their winning ways and were struggling as much that was kind of behind people before they went three and seven themselves was the Rockies who really uh, started struggling again after looking a little bit better uh, after their great start to the season a couple games ago so it's more I think you're making if you keep you're probably making more of a dumb luck than anything else uh because you're just having other teams behind you flunder that you probably could just play average baseball at best for the rest of the season maybe even a tad below average and you would still make the playoffs just because of the way the teams below yeah. you are playing so i don't think it's going to be any yay we made the playoffs we did good to round out the season i think it would more be those other teams just sucked more than you did yeah no i i my final question in terms of this part out of these teams, who scares you the most to jump the Phillies? I'm gonna. I know Reds have the two spot right now but because they're only a half game up on the Cardinals. I'm gonna throw all these teams in there. You have the Reds, the Cardinals, the Brewers, and the Phillies all fighting for the eighth spot. Out of those teams, depending on the way the Central shakes up, who would scare you the most to, to jump over us? Because the Brewers are only a game back, so you gotta throw them into the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, well, the Brewers are also, I mean, if Yelich gets going in the last couple of weeks of the season, well, there you go. Um, the Cardinals, I don't know what the heck happened to their team. They were cruising pretty good, and then they just went, eh, yeah, about that. <laughs> Real quick, I, I think what happened to them, and this is something they're going to have to deal with the rest of the year, is because they missed close to two weeks, they've had to make up, and we thought our doubleheaders were bad. I think fatigue's catching up to that Cardinals team. I mean, just the traveling they have to do from being just worn out from all the doubleheaders, from using, like, every pitcher in the book. Uh, I think that team almost looks spent. That's a good point. Uh, well, then, going over that, I would say Brewers, because the Brewers haven't had as big of a schedule. Also, like I said, you have an MVP that's not playing close to an MVP. So if he starts actually getting going, your team's where they're at in – Almost, it's hard to say this, but almost in spite of Christian Yelich. <laughs> uh, so, like, that's uh, – so saying that, if he's able to get going, then you really, really, really can start doing something uh, here. He's been seeing the ball better. He's been drawing more walks recently. His uh, hitting – you still would like to see him be able to slam the ball around a little bit more, like the you – know, if you're a Brewers fan uh, – like the yell which you know, but that hasn't happened to this point. He's still 208 in his last seven games, so he hasn't improved his average. He's just seems to be kind of seeing the ball a bit better. But, yeah, that team's so weird because when you look at their hitting, it kind of blows. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I agree. Like their averages are not good on that team at all this year, yet – they're still figuring out a way because guys stepped up for them in the pitching department, like Suter as a reliever or a um, opener. And then Corbin Barnes uh, has been ridiculous. Uh, so, uh, I mean, th that's just kind of, everything's kind of just falling into place for them. And uh, what's his name? Uh, you got the spark of, um, I believe they, yeah, they won six, nothing over the Cardinals. Uh, yesterday um well now it's two days ago since it's friday now but the i think they might be a team that could jump over us because they've been getting 
kind of a little bit momentum going due to the more of the help of their pitching, like I said. And you just have Braun reach a milestone. So when you have a career player reach a milestone, sometimes that can be an energy boost for your team. So we'll see what happens there. Tomorrow's the next game. And they also play Kansas City. <laughs> so we also have to keep in mind the Cardinals play Kansas City to round out the season. Then they have a tougher series potentially, um, or not the Cardinals, the Brewers, against Cincinnati, but that also depends if Cincinnati keeps doing good up until next Monday or if they start coming back down to earth. And so, then you have St. Louis. So literally, these all these teams are playing each other. So the likelihood is one of them's probably going to get in. The thing is, will two of them find a way to get in and then knock the Phillies? So that's actually advantage Cardinals, though, in the end, because well, I guess it doesn't matter because they're not chasing the Brewers. But those two teams have to play each other before the Brewers face them. So that'll be interesting how it plays out. But I'm with – I think the Phillies um, hang off that for a playoff spot, whether it's eight, whether they move up to seven. I don't know the Giants' schedule off the top of my head. So it'll be interesting to see what they have to finish out the year with. Um, they got Oakland this upcoming weekend, so obviously a very tough series. Maybe the Phillies can gain some ground on that. Real quick, without like going in too much, obviously Brute Lou Jason playing – they've been playing better baseball than a lot of people think. You get four games with them this week. I'm going two and two. What's your overall prediction? Phillies come out of the series win, series split, or defeat in the series. What's your take to wrap things up? Um, uh, I don't know if this change. I mean, there's no starters outside tomorrow set. Phillies throw Eflin game one, haven't announced game two. The Blue Jays are going with the lefty Robbie Ray for game one while they're going with Ross Stripling game two. After that's not decided, we'll see what the Phillies do. But obviously, you'd expect – well, actually, I don't know what you're going to do with that Arietta, so I don't know who they're going to call for or not. So we'll see what the Phillies do. I guess Ranger. I feel like that might be why they well, sent him down on, to stretch him out. I thought he was on the I.O. Oh, sure. did he go on the I.O.? I saw they sent him down. He would have had to go on the I.O. in uh, camp, which is – Annoying if he got injured in the damn tax. Nah, I, must have, I must have just misread it. They must have just moved him down. Was the um, but the I don't know. We stink in double headers. So I mean, if you don't take one of the double headers, I think you're going to lose the series. Obviously, um, I also don't like this matchup because yes, the Blue Jays struggle pitching, but our bullpen blows. And the Blue Jays have a lot of guys this year that have stepped up seven innings or later. Well, that doesn't match up well against the Phillies bullpen to have a lot of guys that step up in the seven inning, inning mark or later. Except for tomorrow, you don't have to worry about that because you're only playing seven innings. <laughs> but the next two games, unless if they literally walk it off in the seventh inning of the first game, since they're technically the home team. Um Honestly, I don't have much confidence in them beating Toronto. I mean, they haven't shown me anything to to give me confidence in them beating a team that's offensively touted. The, the Your pitching has been abysmal. You've had two guys that have been worth a damn in the bullpen and in the starting rotation. Because you got Wheeler and Nola, then you got Parker and Romero. Everybody else is a wash, and there's no point at even watching the television when they're pitching. Um, Eflin... Is still kind of in between. Um, I still like watching Eflin. It's just he really kind of needs to get going and step up. If uh, one, he probably wants to be on this team next year, but two, to ha- have us have a chance to uh, really get going anywhere um, in the playoffs because you're going to need Zach Eflin as your third starter. So that if he doesn't get going tomorrow, that's going to worry me. I mean, I just don't have confidence against an offensively-minded team when my team has shown me no reason to have confidence in them against an uh, offensive-minded team that we do have a better scoring offense overall than the Blue Jays by a bit, and we hit 256 overall average. They hit 251, so that's pretty close. Um I just I just don't like the matchup. I think Bichette's probably going to kill us, I think. Uh, everybody that's literally not expected to kill us is probably going to kill us because that's kind of the Phillies' way. 
So like you, you have some guy that hasn't hit in three weeks for Tampa or Tampa for Toronto come in and will probably hit a three run home. Because that's kind of the story of the Phillies. The guy you least expect to get a big hit, and that's a 500-foot shot. <laughs> so uh, the fact that Wheeler and Nola already pitched, um, and they wouldn't be slated to obviously pitch in any of these games, unless if they put one of them on short rest. So th- that also makes me not have confidence in this series. So I would say we're going to probably, unfortunately, lose this series. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't have confidence in us winning this series. All right. Well, there you have it. I don't know if you have anything else to wrap it up. If you like what you saw today or like what you saw before, please like and subscribe to our channel. And I don't know if uh, you have anything else to, to finish out here um, to wrap things up. But this this has been another good episode of Jet Packs Jet to the Bank. Joe, what do you got here? You got anything else? The only other thing is since he keeps doing so well, you have to also re-sign, I think, in my opinion, as a clubhouse leader and a leader on the field, Diddy Gregorius. If you don't, and that's a mistake in my eyes. And then obviously if you don't re-sign JT, that's a major mistake. But I also believe not re-signing Diddy. And also you should probably re-sign Blake Parker since he's the only person worth a damn that's not Joe Joe Romero in your bullpen. Uh, not not for a multi-year deal because he's older, but give him a one-year extension. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's important. I think uh, Bryson Stott's still going to be a year or two away after this year, so I think it's perfect to bring back uh, Gregorius for a year or two. Um, he obviously likes Girardi. I think Girardi likes him too, so I agree with that. Uh, bring those guys back. Um, and, hey, another weekend series. I don't know what's going to happen. I think – we, oh, we know what's going to happen. Uh, the Phillies bullpen will find a way to blow a couple games. Um, but I'm going to leave everyone with this one stat. The Phillies have led in 42 of 49 games, and yet they are still have a losing record through 49 games. Absolutely sad, pathetic, embarrassing, whatever you want to call it. And that's the word for it. This team is heartbreaking. Until next time, we'll, we'll we'll break down the Blue Jays series. But this is another episode of Jetpacks to the Bank. For Joe, for Andrew, we'll see you guys at least Sunday night, if not before. Thank you.